what's going on, everybody? Let's see. I've already got quite a few people here. Awesome. All right. So this is real. This is live. I decided, what the heck? It's Friday. Got nothing else to do but hop on a live broadcast, answer some questions, have a little bit of fun. Sorry about this kind of lighting issue in the background there. The blinds are just not doing their job. Anyhow, the whole purpose of this live broadcast, to have a little bit of fun, get a little bit more interactive, do some coaching. There's so many questions that come up. And truth be told, when we were doing the whole keto challenge for that month, just the engagement and the interaction that was happening from the, the subscriber base was just awesome. So I want to get in the habit of doing these semi-regularly, although I have to be completely honest, it's difficult for me to schedule them out because my schedule is so unpredictable. So sometimes they're going to be at totally random like this. Uh, purpose of this, people have so many surrounding intermittent fasting and so much of the content that I have to put out ends up being somewhat redundant and a little bit repetitive simply because I have so many new subscribers coming in. I mean, we're, we're gaining between two and 5,000 subscribers per day. So you have to understand that a lot of times when these new subscribers come in, they're not privy to all the same details that long-term subscribers, uh, you know, have. So they don't know everything that I've talked about. So a lot of times I have to just sort of tease with a little bit of redundant information, which sometimes drive people nuts, but it's just the way it has to get done. So I do want to start this live broadcast out the way that I normally would, which is inviting everyone to comment where they're watching from. So go ahead and just say, you know, hello, where you're watching from. That way I can take a glance over there. We've got North Carolina in the house. We've got, this is awesome. This is so perfect. And then we've got Let's see about well, Alaska in the house. And if I'm glancing over here, that's just where that's where the live chat pops up. So it's just looking there. And holy cow, I can't keep up with that. That's awesome though. I just either way, I love going through this after the fact and checking out where people are watching from and what people are doing. The other thing I want to ask people to do, if you can, go ahead and hit that thumbs up button, that little like button. That way this broadcast gets ranked a little bit higher. It serves it out to the subscribers more. YouTube wants to see that people like it. So otherwise, people on my channel don't necessarily see it. So I'd appreciate that. This is really, really cool. All right. And for a lot of you guys that were asking, yes, we are safe from the fires. We're in Southern California, so the fires got pretty close. Uh, didn't get evacuated this year like we did last year, so it's much better. Anyhow, I'm going to go ahead and dive right into this stuff. I do want to go ahead and give a quick shout out also down to ButcherBox. So ButcherBox, I put a link down below in the description. Uh, special promotion going on right now for those of you that are watching. Uh, there's literally my usual $20 off, plus this time you're getting a free turkey too in honor of Thanksgiving. So if you guys want to take advantage of ButcherBox and check them out, the link is down below in the description. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, so the main thing that I want to do here is answer questions, but I want to go ahead and give a little bit of just a general breakdown of what I want to discuss today. Okay, there's been two videos that have come up on my channel in the last couple of weeks that have really gained a lot of traction. One was the Mediterranean Keto video, and the other one was the which length of fasting is best. So I kind of want to touch on those and use those as sort of a an epicenter, if you will, for like what we're going to talk about. That's kind of what everything's going to be focused on because that's where a lot of my focus is right now. And when I say my focus, it means a lot of my research. I feel like the Mediterranean diet approach is still a long lasted, really clean diet and a really good way for people to live, whether they're keto or not. So it has principles that apply to keto and it has principles that apply to non-keto. And it has principles that certainly apply to intermittent fasting. So I don't want anyone to ever think that you have to do uh, both. You can always do one or the other. You can do keto, you can do fasting, you can intertwine them. It all depends on what your results are. So there's a lot of questions that are already coming in. So let's go ahead and let's start out with some intermittent fasting questions that are coming in first. Just simply because that's what the title of this video is. I don't want to stray away from what I put. I don't want to have any clickbait or anything like that. I do want to talk about Mediterranean keto, but I want to talk a little bit about the intermittent fasting piece that people have questions on. Uh, someone actually, Rab uh, MCL says, hi, I've been fasting. I've been feeling well, but feeling dizzy when standing. Do you know what I can do to stop this? I've been keeping well hydrated, so I know it's not dehydration. Well, that's just the thing is when you're fasting, you don't always know that you're hydrated because the minerals get thrown off. So you don't really know that you're hydrated. In fact, sometimes drinking more water dehydrates you more. You got to think of it like this. Okay, you're intermittent fasting. You're feeling dizzy. You're feeling lightheaded. Maybe you have a headache. So you start pounding more water. Well, what are you doing? Well, you have no or really low levels of insulin. So what's happening is your kidneys will flush out the extra water. And what that means is along with that, they're going to flush out more minerals. So the more water you drink, if you're not repleting with sodium and you're not repleting with magnesium and maybe even some potassium, you can get further dehydrated and it can throw you off a little bit more. Okay, a lot of times the headaches and the dizziness that we feel is not a result of hypoglycemia. It's not the blood glucose getting low. It is a result of usually just that being minerally imbalanced. So I recommend putting a little bit of salt in your water, okay? 
I also recommend getting some inexpensive potassium chloride. Okay, literally go on Amazon, get really inexpensive potassium chloride. It's like 10 bucks for a bag of it. It's gonna last you a year. And you put like a quarter teaspoon of that in your water. That way you're getting sodium and potassium and it's just easy to sip on it all day. So I hope that that solves that issue there. Again, full disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, so I can't handle everything. And I don't know exactly what's going on with you, but I can at least do the best that I can here. Okay, so we already have so many questions coming on in here. So um, actually someone asked, this is a great question, which type of fish is best to eat when coming off of a fast? So when you're coming off of a fast, you usually wanna keep it lean. And I wanna clear this up because a lot of people get confused. They're like, I'm doing keto, but I'm breaking my fast and you're telling me to keep it lean. This doesn't make sense. Here's the thing. We need to keep things as lean and simple to digest as possible when we're breaking a fast. The reason is, is because, well, really it's two or threefold. The first reason is it's hard to mechanically digest things right when you break a fast. Okay, you have to remember that your gut mucosal layer is breaking down a little bit during a fast. It's going through its recycling process. And you have to remember that gut motility changes a little bit. So the whole dynamic of the gut just changes when we're not eating. So if all of a sudden we have this massive bolus of protein and massive bolus of food that comes in, you have to remember that our, our digestive tract is going to be completely screwed up. So it's really important to be eating lean kinds of fish. Now, you can eat lean protein in general, but this particular question was surrounding the world of fish. If you are going to eat fish, I usually recommend some kind of white fish or a shellfish. Okay, the reason that I suggest a shellfish is because most of them are very, very lean. Okay, so you're talking scallops, you're talking clams, you're talking things like that. That's not exactly ideal, but I'm just saying if you want to be able to eat, if you can eat that, that would be the best case scenario. But I know not everyone wants to break a fast with some oysters or some mussels or, or clams. Now, when it comes down to the fish itself, something lean, like wild Alaskan cod or a leaner cut of halibut, some halibut has higher fat content. If you're going to go with salmon, go with the sockeye salmon because the sockeye salmon, although still very, very high in omega-3s, is much, much, much leaner, okay? so. We, we gotta remember that we don't always want high fat cuts of meat and higher quality cuts of meat and fish are going to naturally be leaner. We have to remember that. The really fatty cuts that we get are usually a result of heavily grain and soy and corn fed meat. They put fat on them so they get more at market. It's going to naturally be leaner and the same goes with wild caught fish. Farm raised salmon is usually really like uh, marbled with a lot of fat and it's really fatty whereas wild caught is nice and clean and lean. So anyhow, also just FYI, the link down below for ButcherBox, they also have sockeye salmon if you wanted to check that out. So I put a link, it's right there in the bottom of the description. Highly recommend you do check them out too. Okay, here's another question coming in. Um, let me scroll through here and it's got so many questions coming in. Okay, intermittent fast only two to three times per week, otherwise it will slow metabolism. Can you add clarification? This is a super good and very common question. Now. I talk often about intermittent fasting being done in two ways, okay? You can look at it either way. You can say intermittent fasting is where I intermittently fast a couple times per week, or intermittent fasting can be viewed as I am doing periods of intermittent fasting. So <laughs> potato, potato, but very, very big differences between the two. There are other intermittent fasting uh, gurus, and I don't even wanna know if I wanna call them experts, but just proponents out there that think that intermittent fasting is good to do every single day. I'm not here to say that it's bad to do every day. I just have my concerns, okay? Because what's going to happen is the metabolism is naturally going to respond to how often you're eating in terms, uh, or I shouldn't say how often, but it is going to naturally respond and adapt to whatever it is that you're doing. So if you're fasting every day, that is okay as long as you are okay with accepting that as your norm every day. Okay? You don't leave yourself any room for variance there because what's gonna happen is your metabolism is just going to adjust. And from an evolutionary standpoint, this makes perfect sense. It makes sense for our body to want to adapt to lesser calories. It doesn't mean that a slowed metabolism is bad. You just have to be prepared for it. In fact, think of it like this. Our ancestors often would would die if their metabolisms were too fast. Think about it. If you had a fast metabolism and you went three days without eating, your body would just like start to eat itself. If you had a fast metabolism and you had to go a month without eating and your metabolism never slowed down, it would just continue to eat itself until you'd die. Okay, but if your metabolism has the ability to naturally slow down when food becomes less, then you're slowly becoming more or able to preserve fuel. 
So it's a perfectly natural thing for your metabolism to slow down when calories go down. I just want you to be prepared for that. Now, most of the studies show that intermittent fasting is successful because of, and I quote, spontaneous caloric restriction. Intermittent fasting every day is not spontaneous caloric restriction. That explains why people have tremendous weight loss results in the beginning, but then they just continue on the norm. They feel great, so please don't get me wrong. It is a tremendous lifestyle. It works phenomenally well as a lifestyle, and I don't think that it's going to hurt you, but I do think that you are going to plateau. So it's more important to start small and slowly add more. What good is it if you throw all of your stuff in one bucket at first and you say, I'm diving into intermittent fasting and I'm gonna fast every single day, and then you have nothing left to really pull out the stops on. You already are fasting every day, so what are you supposed to do? Create another day of the week? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense, okay? Let's see, we've got some other questions here coming in. Really good stuff. Okay, this is uh, this question comes from Julia. And Julia, this is a good question because I actually created a list of questions that I've got on another sheet here that have come up from these other videos. So this is great. Julia says, is it better to mix up my intermittent fasting instead of the same window every day? I like fasting 16, eight some days, 18, six some days, 14, 10 some days, and just 12, 12 other days. Julia, that is a phenomenal question and it goes right in line with the video that I put out uh, last week, which is what is the best fasting length for you as an individual? You you just also hit the nail on the head with the last question that I uh, answered, right? Which was all about should you fast every day and spontaneous caloric restriction. I am a huge fan of changing up your length of fast. I honestly don't even have a pattern anymore. I've been doing it for so long now that I go on my feeling and how it feels, right? There are days that I will fast back to back. And there's some days of the week that I'll go 22 hours and then two days later do a 12 hour. It's It really makes no difference in terms of uh, physiologically, actually it makes a lot of difference physiologically, but it makes no difference in terms of a lot of the pieces that you're concerned about. I, I, really what you're gonna see out of that is a lot more mental reprieve and a lot more connection with your body. I just never suggest forcing something that doesn't feel right. 12 hour fast is great because a 12 hour fast gives your body just the reset that it needs. It needs uh, gives you the gut reset that you need. Then a 16 hour fast is a whole plethora of other benefits. 18, a whole other plethora of benefits. So by all means, rotate it out. But just remember that if you're doing so, you're going to have, you know, don't try to squeeze them all into one week is what I'm saying. Don't try to do one of each. Just try to throw them in there whenever you can, if that makes any sense. Um, Let's see. Someone says, how do you raise your metabolism from years of dieting? I actually have a video coming out on that, how to correct a slowed metabolism. Let's see, so many questions coming in here. Um, okay, uh, Anil says, I've lost 19 kilograms of intermittent fasting, but I've plateaued out. I can't lose more, why? I'm up to 20 hours fasting. Okay, so uh, Anil, that kind of sounds like you're, you're heading down the path of just increasing your fasting length. What I would suggest, and this, this goes for a lot of people, let me go ahead and ask a question here, just in line. How many of you watching this video have been intermittent fasting and have hit a, a weight plateau? I mean, maybe you still have the co uh, cognitive benefits, maybe you still have the lifestyle benefits, but you've hit a physical plateau. Your body composition isn't changing. Just type in plateau, just because that's all I need to know, or plateau or stall or whatever, because I think a lot of people are probably experiencing that and this will be a great chance for me to talk to a lot of people. So, okay, lots of people have hit the plateau already. Boom. Enough for me to want to answer this question thoroughly. So when you hit a plateau, it's usually a result of your metabolism just adjusting simply because of restriction of calories or just adjustment to the timing in which you're eating and everything like that. So there's a few different ways that we can go about it, right? I would say, well, there's a lot of different ways we can go about it, but three that come to mind immediately. One is a big leptin spike, okay, where you just... You change your diet dramatically and you increase your calories and you increase even carbohydrates for a little while to shock your body. Is that the route that I suggest you go? Not necessarily, okay? The other thing that you can do is you can start changing your patterns, your timing, your rotation, okay? Similar to Julia's question previously where you, you, uh, you just adjust to a 14 hour fast and then do a 20 hour fast and keep your body guessing all the time. My best answer for you, if you're hitting a plateau, is to shift the time period in which you're fasting. Uh, and what I mean by that is not how long you're fasting, but your time period, your start time. Okay, shift your start time because you have a high degree of uh, link between your fat loss and your circadian rhythm, and people forget that. So what that means is 
your fat loss is linked to diurnal rhythms in your body. And if you have gotten your body adjusted to consistent fasting through the same period of time, okay, I eat my last meal at 8 p.m. and then I don't eat again until two, yada, yada, it's time that you change that because periods of eating and not eating have a direct reflection on your circadian rhythm and how your body burns fat from that. So what I would do when I hit a plateau is I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna start my fast at 4 p.m. instead of 8 p.m. And I'm gonna fast till 10 a.m. I don't know, something different, right? So that is a very powerful way to just shift how your body looks at a fast. And when you get a little bit hungry during your fast because you're doing it at a different time, you know you're doing it right. When your body is no longer hungry repeatedly with fasting, that's how you know you're in a little bit of a rut, okay? So you actually want to live on a little bit of that hunger. It plays a big part. That hunger means that glucagon is spiking. That hunger means that your body is burning fat. Hunger is your friend. Not only does it help with the whole fat loss thing, it's an element of mental mastery, okay? That mastery is what's going to get you through these fasting periods. Again, full disclaimer, I do not think that you should be fasting all the time. I think that when you do periodically or spontaneously restrict calories via fasting, it needs to be in this sort of strict regimented way that allows you to get a little bit hungry, but not to the point where you're jeopardizing your own health or well-being, okay? Um, sorry, the lighting's a little bit off here. So I apologize. Everyone can see me okay? I, I can't tell on my, on my screen, it's showing me really, really dark. So I just wanna make sure that everyone can see me okay. Um, Okay, cool. Everyone says they can see me. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So it says, uh, someone says, would magnesium threonate and glycinate and malate spike my insulin levels? No, you can have those during a fast. I'd be okay with that. Uh, some other good questions. Uh, does yerba mate break a fast? Cecilia, no, it does not. Um, okay, uh, let's see. It says, what would be a good idea for fasting meals for people like myself who are over the road driving and most of the time? Okay, that's actually a good question. Like, if you're, if you're fasting and you're on the road all the time, you're traveling a lot, what should you do? Well, the good news is it actually makes life very easy because you're not having to eat while you're traveling. The bad news is you have to remember that when you break a fast, that's the most, inter that's the most important time of intermittent fasting. So let's touch on this for a second because it opens up a bigger can of worms. What's really important, what is more important and literally the most important thing of intermittent fasting is not necessarily the fasting itself. That is the most beneficial, but the most important piece of intermittent fasting is how you break it. It is the most overlooked, it is the most underrated, and it is the most undervalued and unspoken area. It's what needs to be addressed. How you break a fast is everything. So what you need to do if you are on the road, you need to be someone that is hyper-prepared. The cool thing is if you're intermittent fasting, it's easier to be prepared because you really only have to be prepared for that one initial meal. When you break your fast is when the magic happens. That's when you have the ability to absorb what you are consuming to its maximum degree. So if you are consuming a bunch of preservatives, if you're consuming a bunch of canola oils and low quality things, you can rest assured that those are gonna go inside your cells in a negative way, right? If you use this time to eat good, clean, lean protein, if you use this time to eat clean, lean things, whether you're vegan, vegetarian, meat eater, carnivore, keto or not, whatever, lean protein of some kind, this is how your body is going to assimilate. It's going to use clean, lean protein. So if you're on the road, a pea protein shake, a whey protein shake would work. Uh, if you're on the road, you can always have some chicken prepared. You can always have some, some beef prepared. You can always have stuff like that ready to go. And that's really, really important for you because how you break your fast is everything. Then 60, 90 minutes later after you break that fast is when you have more flexibility with your eating, okay? So remember, break your fast in a clean, controlled way, generally with just some protein. I know I talk about adding carbs into the mix here and there, but for all intents and purposes, for the sake of this video, for the sake of this live broadcast, you're best off, whether you're keto or not, to just have some lean, clean protein. 60, 90 minutes later, you can have more flexibility because your insulin levels have come back down, okay? You spike your insulin, Everything's all hypersensitive, but you've given it a chance to chill out and now you can eat your regular meals, okay? Now, again, I wanna give a big shout out to ButcherBox. I put a link for them down below in the description. So if you're at home and you're not on the road and you're intermittent fasting, highly, highly recommend you use their meat simply because it's a lot cleaner and a lot leaner. The whole grass-fed, grass-finished piece that I talk about in my videos all the time. So the reason I wanted to include them in this live broadcast is because there is a special offer going right now for getting a free turkey plus $20 off if you want to check them out. 
So the best way that you guys can support my channel is help support the brands that I work with because that's how this channel makes money and that's how I'm able to do this. So anyway, just a big shout out to them down in the description below. Okay, let's go ahead and let's answer some of these other questions. Okay, Kelly's Cooking says, love ButcherBox, appreciate that. I'm not, I'm not selling out. This is just how this channel actually has to stay operational because I have a pretty large staff, the amount of content we put out. Uh, fasting with bone broth. Uh, okay, that's a good question. Bone broth fasting is a specific kind of fasting. Okay, it's not something that I would recommend consuming during a fast unless you are doing a specific bone broth fast. Uh, it is a good way to, I don't even call it a traditional break fast. I call it like a pre-break fast. So what that means is, it's going to get a lot of collagen and a lot of support into your gut. And that is a great way to sort of a preamble to food that's coming in. Okay. So you basically, before you eat, you have a little bit of uh, bone broth and that's going to make it so you can handle food a little bit better. Hey, can everyone do me a favor and just hit that thumbs up button, hit that like button. What that's going to do is going to help get a little bit more attention on this video so that, you know, we've got 2 million subscribers or close to it on this channel. And I want to make sure that everyone's able to see this video. And a lot of times, unless you're hitting that like button, people don't see it. Hang on really quick, guys. I have my light here and I accidentally hit the fan on it. Let's see. Now there's a couple other questions that were coming in here. Um, a, a couple, I should say, a lot of questions coming in here. Okay, someone says, does regular fasting work as well as intermittent fasting? I normally go for a 24 hour fast once a week and making steadily. Yeah, that's another way of doing things. Okay, so you have multiple different directions you can go. You can do an intermittent fast where you're fasting uh, shorter, semi-frequently, or you can do longer term fasts a little bit more infrequently. And they all have different, uh, different results, right? And this is something that I've talked about a lot, but I encourage you to look at your calories over the course of a week versus over the course of a day. So those of you that have heard this before, you can tune me out. Those of you that have not, I think you're going to gain a valuable little tidbit that's changed a lot of people's lives. Okay, and that is measure your calories week over week, not day over day. What I mean by that is if you're supposed to consume 2000 calories per day, roughly, if that's what you're supposed to consume, 2000 calories per day, what does that equal to per week? 14,000 calories. I would rather you measure your calories over the course of a week than over the course of a day, because that way you're not sitting there worrying about being in a deficit or a surplus every single day. Because if you go 24 hours without eating, you're automatically in a pretty aggressive deficit, which is already gonna give you a lot more flexibility throughout the rest of the week. However, you know that doesn't mean that you fast for six days and then eat 14,000 calories, okay? There is a line there. But the point is, is sometimes a longer fast gives you where you need to be in order to get your results in terms of that week over week calorie deficit. Because despite what some people will say out there, there is still a practical application for calories in versus calories out. It's just not the holy grail like everyone thought it was five years ago. Calories still matter. We just don't know what a calorie really is to an individual person. An individual person that has testosterone levels through the roof and their body is raging is going to not be the same calorie to a person that has a slowed metabolism that has all kinds of metabolic disorders. It's just not the same. So you need to find your numbers and how you do that is just playing with it over time. All right, lots of questions still coming in. Okay, someone had uh, sent in a super chat where they, they paid for a question. I just wanna make sure that I shout them out because they, they asked about asparagus. They said, how was a way to get asparagus to taste better? I can answer that because I know exactly what you mean. If you take asparagus and you cook it up and you put nutritional yeast on it along with a little bit of salt, it tastes really, really good. So I'll take asparagus, steam it up, and then I'll go ahead and put nutritional yeast on it. And then I will put a little bit of salt and sometimes a little bit of hot sauce. And that tastes really dang good. So that's the way if you need to get asparagus down that I would recommend getting it down. Yeah, someone says steam it with butter. That's also... Someone says, what's your thoughts on kielbasa sausage? You know, sausage is a really wide spectrum there because it could be super clean and it could not be super clean. So it all comes down to as minimal ingredients, preservatives as possible. As far as, is it okay on keto? Absolutely. Uh, Eastack says, what about MCT to break a fast? Glad you brought that up. I know a lot of people that use MCT oil to break a fast. And I think that it is a dangerous slippery slope because MCT does get in your system really quick. And what that does mean is you will keep your ketones elevated, but it's really hard on the GI tract. It's really hard on the gut. And remember, so much of the benefit of intermittent fasting is what we're doing to our gut. Not only the uh, actual cells, not just the actual enterocytes and the endothelial cells within our gut, and the ep or the epithelial lining, I should say, but we're also talking about just the overall health of our gut biome and everything like that. 
very, very, very important. So we want to make sure that we're not damaging that. And a lot of times when we have MCT oil and things like that, that's pretty aggressive digestion. It happens really fast, which can be hard on the gut. So I recommend saving the MCTs for a little bit later. Breaking your fast should be nice and lean. And then 60, 90 minutes later, go ahead and add as much fat as you want if you're doing keto. Hey, give me one second. I'm going to adjust these, uh, these light, uh, this window really quick. It's getting dark. There we go. That's a little bit more light there. Okay, some more questions here. How do you stay on keto without breaking it while on a super busy schedule? You know, I want to save some of those questions because I'm going to finish up some of the fasting stuff and then I want to start talking about the Mediterranean keto piece. Did any, everyone here watch my Mediterranean keto video last week where I really talk about just a new way of doing keto and I think the future of low carb is? Just say Medi Keto or Mediterranean Keto if you did um, because that's, I highly recommend watching that video. I'll link it out after this video. I'll go ahead and edit the description so people can go back through and watch that because I feel like it's a really good thing for people to watch, to learn that keto doesn't need to just be dirty. It can be nice and clean. So I'll talk on that. Um, who here that's watching this wants to see some stuff on MediKeto? Okay, I can already tell there's a lot of interest in that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then eventually I'm going to do a full meal plan on that and put it out on YouTube. But I want to answer some questions that came through on the actual comment section of the last fasting video that I did. And because I think it's a really good place to answer them. So someone said, uh, Eric M654 said, what would be the right refeeding strategy to put the muscle back on after a 36 hour fast? That's a really good question. Okay, so you're wanting to build muscle, you're intermittent fasting, um, but you realize that intermittent fasting itself, obviously you're not building muscle while you're fasting. So what's the best way to break your fast? What's the best thing to eat? Well, this is where things come in handy when you understand a little bit of carb manipulation. So please, 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 everyone that is listening, everyone that's watching, what I'm about to describe does not apply to everyone. This applies to people that are happy with where they are at body fat wise, but want to put on a little bit of muscle because what you are going to do with this strategy that I'm about to talk about is not going to necessarily elicit more fat loss. It's going to elicit muscle growth. And that is where you break your fast with a strategic small amount of carbohydrates. So what that would look like is Still keeping really lean protein, okay? Lean fish, lean beef, lean chicken, uh, pea protein shake, whey protein shake, combined with about 20 grams of carbs if you're keto. Yes, I know that sounds crazy. 20 grams of carbs if you're keto by way of uh, like a rice cake or a corn tortilla or something that's gonna be pretty quick to absorb. The trick is keeping it really, really low fat. Those of you that are just chiming in, remember, this is talking to people that want to build muscle. Okay, so it's very different from people that are just wanting to burn fat. So what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to spike your insulin with the carbohydrates right at the end of a fast. You're going to get an extra high spike in insulin along with protein, which is going to allow the protein to absorb into the muscle significantly easier. Okay, even if you are on keto, you will have enough of a ketone buffer to make it so that even if you are kicked out of ketosis, it's for a very small amount of time. And it is well worth it to get kicked out of ketosis for a small amount of time in order to allow your muscles to really grow because later on, that's going to help you immensely. Then again, 60, 90 minutes later, go about your normal eating patterns. If you are trying to build muscle, you know that your protein should be in a little bit of a surplus. You know, again, perfect place for me to mention, check out Butcher Box down below if you're looking for a good deal on the grass-fed, grass-finished meat. Okay, the next question that came in, uh, let's see. Someone says, can you still build muscle with a 24 to 36 hour fast? Absolutely, you positively can. And then someone says, oh, someone says, uh, can you please make a video about the dangers of fasting too long and too frequently? Um, yeah, you know, that's a good point. I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on this, but it is very, very important. Okay, when you are doing intermittent fasting, it's very easy for it to become addictive. So I want you to be careful that you don't just start extending your fast. So keep yourself in check. So what I would recommend you do is keep a schedule. Write down the days that you fast and keep track of it. When you start seeing that you're, you're increasing your pattern, you're starting to have just too many intermittent fasting days, that's a good indicator. But more importantly than the frequency of this intermittent fasting is when you start just increasing the duration regularly. Next thing you know, you're regularly doing 48 hour fasts, you know, once a week. That's how you know, okay, wait a minute. I think I'm starting to go a little far. Okay, so we wanna make sure that, you know, you just, don't get addicted, not just for your mental health, but for your physical well-being and your results and your outcome from the intermittent fasting. We don't want to lose our results, right? Um, P. 
people people are asking about thyroid issues and intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is absolutely fine for the thyroid. If anything, it actually can improve it because it gives the thyroid a break from glucose. Um, uh, fasting and its effect on impact on fertility, people had asked about. I definitely can touch on that a little bit. Uh, in terms of PCOS and everything like that, um, I won't spend a whole lot of time. But the short answer is women, well, women and men both tend to think that intermittent fasting and keto are not good for trying to get pregnant or fertility. Although the studies show that it's the presence of ketone bodies that actually help with PCOS and ultimately help fertility. Okay, lots of studies that have shown that short stints of the ketogenic diet improve fertility dramatically. And a lot of it has to do with um, the fact that women are designed to be able to survive for longer periods of time without food, simply because they are designed to have more resilient bodies when it comes down to carrying a baby. So don't be afraid of it. Give it a shot. It might just help. But I would highly recommend if you're trying to conceive or anything like that, that you might consider ketosis versus intermittent fasting for a little while. Um, okay. Someone asked, let's see, this is a good question too. Uh, Nick says, hi, Thomas, one question. Should we count when our fast starts last time we consumed anything or after you digested your food without getting too complicated? You should definitely start it after you consume it because you're not going to be able to tell when you digested it because everything's going to vary dramatically. Hey, everyone that's just hopping in here, I, I do want to make sure everyone comments where they're watching from and also hits that like button. So we get a lot of thumbs up, get a lot of engagement, a lot of activity on this video. I'm trying to do these so that we can just drum up some more activity and interaction between everybody. Um, Let's see. Okay. What's your position on salmon row and fasting? Ah, I'm glad that some, this is a weird one, but it's a good one. So Matthew, you bring up something called uh, row or fish eggs. This is weird, right? It sounds weird at first, but does anyone want some nerdy science really quick? Cause this is wild stuff. There's actually recent science that shows that fish eggs like row and masago and caviar, things like that. They have a specific kind of DHA in them a specific kind of omega-3 that is not in anything else, at least in that abundance, okay? It's called lyso-DHA, and it has the ability to cross into the blood-brain barrier very, very easily. So normally, the DHA that we take in crosses the blood-brain barrier through uh, like a specific kind of shuttle that it has to wait for. Okay, lyso-DHA doesn't, essentially doesn't have to wait for a shuttle. It can pass through via a gradient and it can just get into the brain. So it means that by consuming things like salmon roe and masago and stuff like that, if you're having a little bit of sushi, you're going to get more of a brain effect. So if you're trying to get, uh, go to fast because you're trying to get this massive surge of brain energy, it does not hurt to, when you break your fast shortly thereafter, have some salmon roe. I know it's weird. I mean, it's totally random, but guys, can we make sure we hit that thumbs up button? We've got, you know, over the course of this, we've had a couple thousand people in here and only see 666 likes. So let's go ahead and get that up, I'm trying to answer some questions so we can get a lot of engagement, make a lot of people happy. Okay, watching from Salem, Oregon, standard keto, I have my birthday, wow, 37 pounds in a month. That's amazing. Okay, so I'm just waiting for it. There we go. Okay, Deb asks a question, says, opinion on fasting through dinner as opposed to fasting through breakfast. Totally, okay, so I was just talking about that a little bit earlier. That is one of my favorite ways to adjust the fast. So I talked about this uh, in one of my coaching videos before. One of my favorite things to do nowadays is shift up my fasting window and shift up when I work out during my fasting window. So I was always, always the kind of guy that would stop eating at night and then I would go through the nighttime and I'd work out first thing in the morning. Now that was for a lot of reasons. One, it was just, if I didn't work out in the morning, I would slack off and I wouldn't do it. So I want to make sure that I did it in the morning. But then as I decided to change things up a little bit. It actually happened by happy accident one time. So my son's nap time is usually between like 12 and 2 p.m., right? So we were out of town, we were on a little vacation and we had gone for a hike in the morning, I was fasted and we came back and we put the kiddo down for his nap and I was still fasted and I looked at my wife, I said, I need you mind, I'm gonna go work out while he's napping. So I went to the gym at 12 o'clock and this was at the end of my fast and I worked out and I had this kind of weird sensation while I was working out. I felt a slight bit weaker, but in a lot of ways, I felt more powerful. I had more stamina and endurance. I'm like, wow, I felt really good. And then I broke my fast as I usually would, maybe a little bit more protein. And I started feeling amazing. I'm like, wait a minute, this is interesting. So I did it a couple of days later and it just kind of became somewhat of a new pattern. Now it's not always doable for me because once again, my schedule doesn't permit that. But the point is, is that by shifting my workouts, it made a big difference, but the same thing applies to shifting my fasting time. So I tried the same kind of thing. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to start my fast earlier, like at four or 5 PM versus eight or 9 PM. 
and then go all the way through. And then that way I can still fast in the morning or excuse me, I can still work out first thing in the morning, yet it'll be at the later part of a fast. So I still get all the benefits without having to mess up my schedule. I hope that makes sense for everybody. So because I still wanted to work out in the morning, but I wanted to work out as close to the end of a fast as possible, I started my fast earlier and it's worked phenomenally. So I hope that that answers your question. Um, Guys, let's go ahead and let's go ahead and transition this into a little bit of Mediterranean keto. Okay, I've answered a lot of questions on fasting, and I know I, I just have to encourage everyone to go back through my catalog of videos and watch a lot more in the way of intermittent fasting videos because I've got so many. And I know the bulk of my following is surrounding intermittent fasting and keto, but mainly fasting. So I want to make sure that I'm always doing a, a positive service by answering questions there and doing what I can. So let's transition and talk a little bit about Mediterranean keto because this is the future of keto, a future of low carb. And it really takes away a lot of the, just the ammunition that some of the anti-keto communities have. And that's what I really like about this approach, because I think it, it allows everyone to come in and enjoy the benefits of keto. So what this Mediterranean keto thing is about is it's all about eating a Mediterranean style diet, but with ketogenic overlying principles. Okay. So what this means is they're perpendicular diets. They work in tandem with each other. Okay. Whereas like some diets are not perpendicular. Some diets don't cross over. For example, a high carb and a low carb diet are opposing diets, right? They do not run perpendicular, but Mediterranean keto is just a certain classification, a geography of food, if you will. And then keto is a macronutrient range. Okay. So you can do Mediterranean keto and just eliminate the carbohydrates or reduce the carbohydrates. The whole benefit of Mediterranean keto is to get all the anti-inflammatory effects of the ketogenic diet and all the anti-inflammatory effects of the Mediterranean, the, uh, Mediterranean diet. The purpose of keto, in my opinion, is not just to lose weight, it's to modulate inflammation. Now, those of you watching this video, you may or may not know my history, okay? But I was 280, actually closer to 290 pounds at my heaviest, okay? And the reason that I started keto 10 years ago was not because I wanted to lose weight, actually. It was because there were a lot of doctors in my ear telling me that my C-reactive protein levels and that my interleukins and all my inflammatory markers were through the roof and that I was going to die. My concern was more about not dying than it was about losing weight. I would gladly still be 280 pounds if I was could have been healthy. My, okay, I shouldn't say gladly, but the point was, is I was trying to save my life. I wasn't trying to lose weight. So my focus was on reducing inflammation. The weight loss was a side effect. And after I started losing weight, of course, that became the stronger goal. Okay. So that's how a lot of my brand was built. Just in case you guys don't know, like I was really heavy dude. So that whole process taught me that inflammation is the underlying cause of everything. And that's why I started keto because I wanted to modulate inflammation and control a lot of these illnesses that ran in my family. I didn't want to be diabetic. I was already borderline diabetic. I was hypertensive. So here's the thing. When I started keto, it wasn't about having a bunch of just processed garbage. And it wasn't about having even a lot of this, just the, the nasty treats that are out there these days. I'm, I'm a fan of a few keto treats, but a lot of things are just getting so full of garbage. It's defeating the purpose of what keto is all about, controlling inflammation. If we have huge boluses of different nutrients coming in at one time, different things at one time, we activate different mechanisms in the body that trigger more inflammation. So why not keep it clean? And that's what the Mediterranean keto is all about. Okay. So high amounts of fish, high amounts of chicken, high amounts of really, really lean, good quality beef, okay, not low quality, dirty keto stuff, pretty low dairy, minimal dairy, and really controlled dairy, high mono and polyunsaturated fats, and relatively low saturated fats. And I'd be the first to say, I am not anti-saturated fat. I have talked about it in so many of my videos that saturated fat is not bad. I'm not here to say that it's bad, but I am here to say that I do think that we get more benefit from a poly and mono unsaturated fat than we do from a saturated fat. Simply by nature of fat utilization and allocation in the body, we do not use as much in the way of saturated fat as we do in the way of poly and mono unsaturated fats. If we look at beef and meat that was processed 50, 60, 70 years ago compared to meat today, it was significantly leaner, significantly higher in poly and monounsaturated fats and significantly lower in saturated fat. Nowadays, the meat that we get at the grocery store is really high in saturated fat and significantly lower in poly and mono, okay? Now, different meats have different, different sources and different amounts, and that's all you know, really neither here nor there because I don't want to go into a lot of the detail. But the point is, is we're keeping our lean protein in place and we're adding our fats in through clean, quality, 
oils, okay, through olive oil, through avocado oil, through avocados, through olives, okay, fats like that, expeller press, walnut oil, good quality oils, okay. Fish is going to be a huge point of it. If you've ever lived in Europe or spent time in Europe, I lived in Europe for about six months. I lived in Italy. So, I mean, I wouldn't say I lived there, I guess. I mean, six months doesn't really constitute living, I guess, but I was there for about six months. So I went to school there for a little while. And I remember like uh, Fruta del Mara and all this stuff that was really high quality, like calamari that wasn't breaded, like good shellfish, good things like that. Such a big focal point, right? And there's so many benefits of the fish and the shellfish that go far beyond just creating ketones in our body. Okay. The ketone piece is important. We create ketones from high fat, low carb, moderate protein. Okay. But we want the benefits from the protein and from the good fish and the good meat itself. So let's go ahead. And I, I took a list of some of the questions that came through on the Mediterranean keto video, and I think they're going to answer some of yours. So I do want to make sure that you know, you're locked in and, and you're not going anywhere. Cause I'm going to answer some good questions. So if you have just chimed in, please comment where you're watching from. If you haven't already, please hit that like button, hit that, that, that thumbs up button. And also while we're talking about all this, you know, these videos are made possible by my sponsors. So do want to give a big shout out to butcher box down below in the description, all the meats that I'm talking about with Mediterranean keto, with the exception of the shellfish can be found through butcher box. And right now special offer for those that celebrate Thanksgiving, you get a free turkey if you check them out. So check them out down below in the description. All right, let's go ahead and let's dive into this. Eric Dancy said, would chicken not fit perfectly into a Mediterranean keto diet? Chicken does fit perfectly into a Mediterranean keto diet. The hard part with so much chicken is it's hard to find good quality chicken. So just make sure you're sourcing your chicken properly. You're not getting chicken that's loaded with a bunch of soy, loaded with a bunch of grain. Newsflash, very hard to find chicken that doesn't have some soy in it. You're going to have it, but that's why you switch it up. Don't just do chicken. Little Voice says, instead of olive oil, can we have whole olives, uh, then reducing the risk of oxidation? You know, olives can still oxidize too. So that was a good question. Uh, olive oil is only going to oxidize if it's low quality or if you are cooking with it. So you just don't want to heat olive oil above like 300-ish degrees, and then it's really, really solid stuff. Um, is fruit-infused olive oil a no-go on keto? Uh, it depends on the quality. Uh, this is a good question. Someone asked about olive oil. They said, isn't olive oil a processed food? Would it be better to eat the olives, avocados, and coconuts as opposed to eating the oil? I stopped keto because I was concerned about getting a fatty liver. I have been doing Mediterranean since. Well, I love that you're doing Mediterranean already. Okay, Mediterranean is great. Um, you should still be getting those healthy fats coming in either way. Now, you shouldn't be opposed to eating the oils though. Just because they're extracted from the foods doesn't necessarily make them bad. I understand your point but most of the foods that people eat in general are highly processed. I mean, they're adding preservatives and things like that. I think, you know, for years and years and years and centuries and probably thousands of years, we've been squeezing and extracting oils out of things. You know, I don't think that's a big deal. So if we're getting the oil from the olives, it's not a huge deal. Then you're actually not getting the fiber and some of the other things that could slow down some of these effects. Talk about that in another video. But anyway, the point is, I think you'd be really solid doing Mediterranean keto. Okay, I have to address this one because someone had asked about uh, oxalics, uh, sorry, oxalic acid and oxalates. He says, warning, lots of high oxalic foods in this list. Almonds, spinach, chia, olives will ruin your health in the long run. Please do some research on oxalates and resulting conditions. For those of you that are concerned about oxalates, I have done a video specifically on oxalates. I do not think you need to be concerned because the amount that you would have to consume would really be pretty high. There are going to be others that are going to disagree with me and that is absolutely fine. But I do think that the positive health benefits of consuming almonds and chia and olives and things like that far supersede the negative impact that you might get from oxalates. What oxalates are, are basically things that chelate minerals in the body. So if we have oxalates, it, they are said to chelate minerals in our gut, thereby blocking the absorption of them. So we're hurting our health in the long run. My argument to that is that if you're doing keto in a clean fashion, you are producing such a high amount of gut stem cells, okay, per some recent evidence in the journal Cell, okay, circa August 2019, brand new research comes out and shows that high levels of ketones allow gut stem cells to optimally divide, ultimately multiply, excuse me. So what that means is that we are producing more stem cells when they are saturated with healthy ketones, far outweighing the negative effect of potential chelation of some minerals. You're not gonna be have almonds with every meal. You're not gonna be having uh, nuts with every meal. You're not gonna be having olives with every meal. It's all about diversity. Anyhow, end rant. Okay, next uh, question says, what oil are you supposed to cook saute with if not olive oil? In that case, avocado oil all the way, high smoke point. 
Uh, people ask about coconut oil. Can you cook with coconut oil? Yes, you can. It has a higher smoke point than olive oil, but not as high as avocado oil. Uh, also recommend uh, ghee. I mentioned in the Mediterranean video, ghee is okay because although ghee is technically considered a saturated, it also has other components, but it's also so high in uh, excuse me, short chain fatty acids. It's very, very good for the gut. And that's a great one to cook with. Uh, you can also mix a little bit of avocado oil with some ghee and have a great solution there. Guys, can we make sure we hit that thumbs up, please? Really appreciate it. Just hit that like button, hit that thumbs up. And I know my lighting is going to, to heck in a handbasket here simply because it's getting darker here. We're going to go take my kiddo out to, uh, we live near a little north of LA and there's a cool thing going on in uh, Calabasas where they have like, it's called Night of the Jacks where they take like just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jack-o'-lanterns and do some really cool stuff with them. I'm excited. It's also my kiddo's second birthday this weekend. So we're really excited. And by the way, fun fact, I know some of you may not care and some of you may tune out when I say this, but that's fine. Uh, we had our announcement this week on Instagram, but we are expecting a new baby in May. So May 5th is the due date. So just, you guys are going to have a whole new world of content coming for me when it comes surrounds having two kids, it's going to change the game. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure I said that some of you guys don't care. A lot. Yeah, it's so funny, like 200 people, boom, gone from the broadcast. It's like the second I talk about my personal life, people just like, like Thomas, you are a resource and a resource only. And the second that you show your human nature and we're gone. It's so funny how people are. Anyhow, um, then the next question, organic grass-fed Greek yogurt be included? I'd be okay with Greek yogurt. I think that's a fairly common one on a Mediterranean diet. Um, would love to see a meal plan, but in the Mediterranean, they do not use any grass-fed finished animal fats for cooking. Seems much more ancestry available and appropriate than avocado oil. Yeah, see, there would be some modifications, I think. Uh, I think the Mediterranean keto, no, the, excuse me, the traditional Mediterranean diet calls for much less in the way of animal product. Um, they use a lot of plant source. I would change that a little bit because I do know the benefits of specific animal products. Um, you know, I do videos on vegan keto, vegetarian keto. I, I try to help everybody, but I think the one that fits my balance the most is the Mediterranean keto. Uh, someone says, how does tuna fit in? Because it wasn't mentioned at all. So tuna is important. And I think tuna would have a place, but you always want to remember that tuna is very high mercury content. So you want to keep it to a minimum. I would say once a week or once every two weeks. Uh, ghee and Mediterranean, let's see, sorry, that's a little bit of a redundant question. What about vegetarian, vegan, Mediterranean keto? That's the plus side is I think it's very, very doable. Normally it's hard to get a vegan keto diet to work, but with Mediterranean keto, it fits in line. Uh, any opinion of krill oil? Krill oil, very high in that Lysa DHA that I talked about a little bit earlier. So perfect question, uh, perfect there. What about bacon? That would not be a lean protein, but it's allowed on the Medi Mediterranean keto diet. So it's not a lean protein, but there's also going to be some fattier cuts of meat that are going to be there. It's all about how it's sourced and how it's processed. Example would be like, if you look at uh, tapas, like you know Spanish food, high amounts of good quality cured meats, ham, prosciutto, things like that. It's clean and it's really not even necessarily lean, okay? But it's all about the balance of the other foods that it's with. The standard American diet is high fat, high sugar combined. That's already a problem. Then you add the processed stuff into the mix and it becomes a bigger problem. The Mediterranean keto, at least 100% is getting rid of the processed stuff. And then it's also getting rid of the bulk of the dirty saturated fats that we don't want. Okay, the trans fats, everything like that. It just makes it much, much cleaner. So I hope that that makes sense for everybody. Okay, so we still have a thousand people on this broadcast. This is awesome. I wanna go ahead and I wanna answer a couple more questions just so we can have some fun with this. Uh, let's go, uh, someone says, Alan Simpson says, where can I see the butcher box info? Uh, there's a link literally below this video. It might not show up until the broadcast is done. I don't know if it's working for anybody, but people keep asking about where to see it. So I'm not sure how it works on a, on a live broadcast, but I put it in the first line of the description, a link to ButcherBox. So that's, and right now there's just for a few days, there's a whole option to get $20 off plus a free turkey. So it's kind of cool. If, turkey would work on Mediterranean keto, by the way, just no stuffing. Well, actually technically stuffing would work on regular keto, but not on Medi or regular Mediterranean, but not on uh, Mediterranean keto. Okay, let's go ahead. Best cheese on Mediterranean keto? I love that question. And they suggest in their own question, they suggest, what about goat? Yes, goat cheese would be the cheese that I would lean on the most because it's a lower casein content and it's also a lower A1 casein. So it's a lower form of, well, let's call it an addictive casein because that's what it is. So a lot of times the cheeses are high in what is called BCM7. BCM7 is a bioactive opioid, which literally makes you addicted to it. If you ever notice when you eat cheese, you become chronically addicted to it. You just feel like you want more. And I don't mean you need your fix immediately, but you just, it slowly becomes part of your diet. And all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I'm eating a lot of cheese. What's going on here? Well, that is a very common thing. And it's because of the A1 casins that have that BCM7, that bioactive opioid. 
Uh, we want to avoid cheeses like that, also avoid the processed cheeses. We want to go for cheeses that are aged as long as possible. As they go through an aging process, they become lower in lactose, they become lower in casein, and they become easier for the body to break down because they essentially are longer cultured. So we want uh, things like, uh, well, the goat cheese for one because it's lower in casein. We're going to have a good clean mozzarella is really clean because it's kind of the opposite. It's not very aged, but it's really, really clean and really, really simple. Okay, we can have some kind of uh, Romano cheeses. We can have uh, grues. We can have some kind of goudas. We can have like aged white cheddar is really good. Anyway, there's a whole lot that I can go on. We can have Parmesan, things like that. I've done a video that broke down the best and worst cheeses to begin with. It wasn't necessarily for Mediterranean keto, but it was just in general. So I highly recommend that you check that video out later on. What about peanut butter? Okay, I would typically say peanut butter for keto and for fasting is a no-go, simply because peanuts are a legume and they're very inflammatory. Now, what that means is they can trigger an issue with, sorry, someone's coming to my door here. I'm not sure what's going on. Someone's at my door and I'm, hang on everyone, hang on. That's how you know this is live. Someone came to my door in my office and everyone has gone home for the day. So anyhow, um, when it comes down to, where was I? Oh man, I already lost my memory. Uh, <laughs> it comes down to the cheeses. We were talking about cheese. Oh, peanut butter. So peanut butter, the legumes are inflammatory anyway. So they trigger sort of an allergen response to begin with. And that can trigger kind of a cross reaction for inflammation. So I recommend going with like a walnut butter, pecan butter, macadamia nut butter. And last place would be an almond butter. I still like almond butter, but if you have other options, I know they're generally, you know, pretty spendy, but they're a little bit better. So like walnut butter, macadamia nut butter are some of my best. Um, Chris says, I'm hesitant to eat the seaweed from Trader Joe's due to the expeller pressed canola oil. How many of them to be typically eaten a sitting? I usually do. If I do that, I have like a half a pack. They're super good. So it's easy to eat a lot of them, but I will say canola oil is not good, but excuse me, expeller pressed canola oil is significantly better. Okay. Cause the expeller pressing itself cleans up a lot of the particles. So what happens with canola oil and oil in general is it usually gets highly refined with like an oil like that. So you take rapeseed oil and they have to process it a bunch and they have to cure it with different chemicals to make rapeseed oil not toxic. So this can be a big problem. So basically what we have to focus on is if you do have to go for canola oil, always go expeller press. So big kudos to Trader Joe's for at least doing that. I wish they would go a little bit uh, cleaner than that. <laughs> you know, someone said, I just ate peanut butter for my sweet tooth. I don't, okay. You're human. We're all human. I mean, I lived on peanut butter and tater tots and burritos, but I mean, for a while, but the point is, is that if you have options, exercise your options, you don't need to just, you know, do different things. You don't need to just eat the same thing. You can change. Okay. So I'm looking at other questions here. Thomas is the goat, <laughs> I guess the goat cheese, right? Yeah. Um, what do you think of sunflower oil? Sunflower oil, not the best, still high omega-6. Remember, whole goal here is we're trying to balance our omega-3. That's like the big benefit of Mediterranean keto is we're getting a good high omega-3 profile. We're getting that balance of omega-3 to omega-6 that we truly need. Uh, someone says hummus. Okay, what about hummus? Um, not necessarily keto-friendly, but it's going to be okay on fasting, just not right when you break your fast. You want to have it later on. Okay. Um, someone says write a book. I am. I'm in the process of writing a Mediterranean book, Mediterranean keto book. Where can you get good quality cheeses? Usually at specialty stores, unfortunately. Uh, I'm usually talking like some kind of uh, whole foods, sprouts, anything like that, somewhat specialty stores. What's the best way to move to a Mediterranean keto diet if you're going from a keto diet already? Do it all at once or small changes? Uh, Chris, you could totally go all at once. It's not too aggressive of a change where you're gonna see any kind of negative impact. It's all gonna be positive. You've already made the toughest part, which was getting through keto in the first place. So now you're just, enhancing your keto. It's just an elevation of keto. And I don't expect everyone that's starting keto to start Mediterranean keto, right? Like it can be a difficult thing to jump on immediately, but if you go keto, then Mediterranean keto, and then implement some fasting along with it, that's a tremendous evolution. Let's see. Uh, you're welcome, Chris. What about anti-inflammatory eating? That's actually what I've been talking about. So if you go back to the earlier part of this broadcast, you'll see it. Uh, do I eat shark steaks? Shark steaks, although tasty, are so high in mercury, I have them about once a year. Uh, let's see, so many questions. I do have a vlog on resistant starches. Uh, so if you just type in my name and type resistant starch, I talk about that. Uh, resistant starches are kind of a weird thing because remember what you're doing, the whole idea with resistant starches, just so that people know, is you're, you're eating specific kinds of, of starches or you're heating or reheating starches in an effort to manipulate the, the the starch structure so that you either absorb more or less. 
And the premise is that like when you reheat a starch, it changes the starch to a different kind of structure, which makes it so it absorbs more slowly. But think about what you're doing. You're physically manipulating something to manipulate how it's absorbed in your gut. So you have an off and on, right? Yeah, it slows down the absorption, but it can also wreak some havoc on your gut. So I'm not a big fan of playing around and relying on the manipulation of starches for that. Anyhow, that's complex. We talk about that in another video. Um, let's see. Can you do a video on gotta get? That's. I'm glad that someone brought this up. They said, can you do a video on how to get through eating through the holidays? This is a great question to end on because as we get now, it's November. We're getting through November. We're getting through December, and we really have to make a big focus on like what are we going to do. Okay, I know that a lot of people that do keto come off keto. They come off keto during the holidays, and I absolutely understand. And quite frankly, if you're going to come off keto, it's not a bad time to. But the important thing is that you're not coming off of keto only to eat holiday meals that are unhealthy. If you're going to come off of keto, you should come off of keto strategically. And I actually have a video that's coming out on this here soon on how to properly come off of keto. Okay. You should implement more periodic intermittent fasting as you come off of keto, as you introduce carbohydrates a little bit more seamlessly, because what you don't want to do is go keto all the way right up to Thanksgiving and then blow it all on Thanksgiving when you're insulin sensitive and everything you just ate gets absorbed. I would rather you just decide for the next couple of months, you're going to go intermittent fasting with low carb, maybe not you know keto, but low carb. So your body's at least adjusted to the carbs. And then you're using intermittent fasting as your primary tool. I recommend that to a lot of people because they just don't feel like they can hang with keto during the holidays. And there's nothing wrong if that's not, if that's not who you are and if it feels wrong and it doesn't feel like, I'm not here to tell you that's wrong or right. I'm here to provide solutions so that you can get through the healthiest way for you. I'm not going to point fingers or say anyone's right or wrong unless they really deserve like sometimes the sugar industry. Okay. But here's the thing. If you at least decide that you're going to come off keto, you need to come off before you go and you, you know, binge because I want the contrast to be less. I don't want the contrast to go from super healthy to super unhealthy. I'd rather you go super healthy to at least having some carbs in the diet than the little blip when you have a holiday meal back to something normal and then hit it hard and aggressively. Of course, the best option is to just keep it clean, keep it keto throughout the holidays. But anyhow, I mean, for what it does come down to, and I know I sound like a broken record, and those of you that are watching this video are probably like, Thomas, shut up already. But regarding holidays, butcher boxes down below, you can at least start, at least use clean meat, right? So there's a free turkey option down below, free turkey plus $20 off. So check them out down below in the description. Um, the other thing that you can do during this time of like travel and everything like that is if you're traveling, make sure you're fasting through your travel. Okay, I have a video coming up on that. Make sure you're using apple cider vinegar when you travel because it helps the gut biome balance out a little bit more. Again, full detailed video on that coming up. I have that launching late November, early December, just so that you can have uh, have those tools when it comes down to traveling. So it's really, really important. You know, you don't have to stick keto all the time. I think if you focus on a Mediterranean style diet over the next couple of months, you'll enter the new year in a really strong fashion. So anyhow, guys, it's been about an hour. I'm gonna have to wrap this up. I really do appreciate everybody being here. This has been an amazing hour long broadcast. Can we get one last big surge of thumbs up? One last surge of likes. We're at 923 likes. Can we end this broadcast with a thousand likes? Can we get a bunch more people to hit that thumbs up button? Or do we just have a bunch of people that are listening to me and not, not doing anything? Just have me going in the background because that's how I feel most of the time as I just ramble. So there we go. There's a lot of likes. Okay, you guys are awesome. Appreciate everyone's kind words. Appreciate everyone being so awesome. As always, make sure you keep it locked in here on my channel. Make sure you let me know what kind of videos you want to see. And make sure you let me know what is working for you so that I can continue to improve the content that I love to create so much. You guys are awesome. Have a tremendous weekend. And I'll see you tomorrow for a new video.